So let's review coordinate graphing. Um, so notice that I have a piece of graph paper and that I have a ruler. Whenever I ask you to make a graph, I expect you to use graph paper and a ruler to, for your straight lines. So let's draw a set of axes on here. Uh, long, long ago, when mathematics started first uh, blossoming, I guess, in ancient Greece, um, mathematics was done with a compass and a straight edge, and that was it. So all of the geometry that y'all know um, was developed with just a compass and a straight edge. And then a long time later, this French mathematician and philosopher named René Descartes realized that if he took a plane and he put a pair of scaled axes on the plane, he could locate points with something called an ordered pair or give it a location in the plane. And if you do that and you put circles or ellipses or curves or lines on the plane, you could um, describe those shapes, those lines, those curves, those circles with equations. And so that's why algebra loves these coordinate grids um, is because we can take the curves that you learn uh, in geometry or these other classes and just turn them into equations. So right now this point has really no location because I haven't given you a scale for my axes. So this axis is just a number line and this axis is just a number line. They're perpendicular to each other so that I can have a horizontal location and a vertical location for every single point in the plane. We call the horizontal axis the x-axis and we call the vertical axis the y-axis. And when we graph data, the x-axis is always where you put your dependent variable and our independent variable, sorry, and the y-axis is always where you put your dependent variable. So I need to put a scale on these axis, axes. I need to tell you what I'm counting by so that we can give a location to that little dot. Now, a rule of thumb for algebra is um, that your scale has to match your data or your equation. There's nothing worse than having like your scale be super tiny and all of the interesting things in your graph appear outside. So you have to make sure your scale fits your data. Now I'm just plotting data points so it doesn't really matter. Um, and you also have to realize that in algebra your x-axis isn't always going to count the same as your y-axis. Uh, it, sometimes it can't. Uh, when if you have to graph something called an exponential function, um, you get y values that are hundreds and thousands compared to x values that are like up to 10. So you have to make sure that whatever scale you pick matches your data. So, and they don't have to be the same. Once again, I'm going to actually show that here. I'm going to make my x-axis count by twos. So 4, 6, 8, and 10. So each one of my little tick marks on my axis represents two on the x. And I'm going to make my y-axis count by fives. So 5, 10, 15, 20. And so then the location of this point is now 6, comma 15 because I always locate my point using the x-axis value first and then the y-axis value next. This number here, 615, is called an ordered pair and it tells everyone where this point lives in relation to the other points that I might graph. Now we have some important points on this graph mainly, or this coordinate axis, that point right there where the two axes intersect. This is called the origin and the origin is kind of where everything begins and it has an ordered pair zero, zero. All right. Now, when I put these axes on a plane, I get six places where a point can live. It can live in one of these four sections, which are called quadrants, or it can live on an axis. And you have to realize that if you are a point in a plane, you either live in a quadrant or you live on an axis. You can't live in two places at once. You are either in a quadrant or you are on an axis. Uh, we number these quadrants. This quadrant here is quadrant one. Whenever you look at real world data, like when you graph data from an experiment, usually things happen in quadrant one. And you want to count clockwise, but uh, you don't. This is actually quadrant two over here, and this is quadrant three over here, and this quadrant right here is quadrant four. Okay, so if I look at the kind of points uh, that live in these, I can look at a point and know what quadrant's going to live in. Because quadrant one has ordered pairs that are positive and positive. The x value is positive, the y value is positive. Quadrant two, I have negative x values and positive y values. Quadrant three, everything is negative. And then in quadrant four, I have positive x values and negative y values.
Now, if I live on an axis, I have a zero as one of my ordered pairs, so, uh, one of my ordered pair. So, for example, the x-axis points have some x value and then a zero. And then if you live on the y-axis, you have some zero and some y. Now, points on a graph that are on the x axis or the y-axis are called intercepts, and those are incredibly important points on your graph. Now, before we go on and actually graph an equation, I want to talk about a couple of things that are super important to your graph uh, and constitute what we call a high-quality graph. Um, make sure that um, you use the appropriate scale for your data, one. Second, um, use graph paper and a straight edge for, for lines. Um, make sure that your scale matches your data. I believe I've said that before, and that's, I'm going to say it a million times. Make sure your scale matches your data, because there's nothing worse than like a graph that big. Like I can't, what is that? I can't see that. Um, so make sure your scale is appropriate. Um, if you're graphing an equation, I want you to connect the dots, as I will s soon show you, with either the appropriate line or curve. Um, put arrows on anything that goes forever. Like these axes go on forever. That's why I put arrowheads on them. Um, be sure to label your axes, x-axis, y-axis, and label your scale. Your graph literally means nothing until there is a scale. So if you ever turn, you can turn in like the most beautiful graph of this thing called a parabola ever made. But if there is no scale, you will get no credit for your beautiful graph because literally your graph means nothing without scale. So make sure that you have labeled your x and y scales on your graph. All right, so let's look at an example of an equation. So in a couple of days, I'm going to have you graph something like this, y equals x minus 2. And I'm going to give you some x values to start off. Uh, and so I can give you like negative 3 and negative 2 and negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Usually, that's going to be kind of enough information to figure out what the graph is going to look like. So here are my x values. Now this is where the evaluating algebraic expressions come in because I'm going to replace these values for x. So negative 3 minus 2 is negative 5, negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3, and then I get negative 2, and I can just follow the pattern. That's actually why we did the pattern stuff first because as soon as you figure out the pattern, you can just follow it as opposed to doing all that crazy work and evaluating. So now when I graph this, I have to make sure that my x scale includes negative 3 to 3, and then my y scale includes 1 to negative 5. So I don't need to make a huge graph or anything. Now if these y values went from 0 to 240, then I'd have a problem. But they don't. So I can actually make my x-axis and my y-axis count by the same thing. Now notice, I didn't put the origin in the very center of my grid. I don't have to. I actually want to place my origin in a place that gives me the best picture of the data. You have to remember that graphs are just pictures, and I want to get as much information as I can for my picture. Okay, so I have x and y labeled, and I have my arrowheads placed on things that go on forever, like my axes. Uh, now I have to remember my scale. So I'm going to just have this count by 1. And this would be negative 5, and this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Notice I'm not putting numbers on every single tick mark. I don't have to. As long as I am consistent, meaning each tick mark in this case is just represents 1, and I label enough so that someone who reads my graph knows my scale, I'm fine. And I'm going to have my y-axis count by 1's as well. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Aha! Make that negative 5. Now make sure you put the sign negative 5 and negative 5 for the negative portions of the graph. So now I'm going to plot my points. So at negative 3, I have negative 5. So I have a dot there. And at negative 2, I have negative 4. And at negative 1, I have negative 3. At 0, I have negative 2. At 1, I have negative 1. At 2, I have 0. And at 3, I have 1. And it looks like these data points fall in a line. And so I'm going to connect these because in between each of these data points are more data points that I didn't figure out. Like I didn't plug in a half or negative one half or two thirds, but I know I could into that equation and get a value. And it's going to be in between those points. Now since this lines up in a line, I'm going to get my ruler and I'm going to draw a, a line that connects these dots. 
this is a graph of an equation. When you graph equations, you have to connect the dots with whatever the dots are showing you. In this case, they're showing me a line. Now notice I extended my line out because I can go on and plug in a 4, a 5, a 6, a 7. This thing's going to go on forever. So what am I supposed to do to it? Put arrows on the ends. And you can do that when you have to graph an equation. Now this is a picture of the equation y equals x minus 2.